Right. Apologies for that. I switched off the fan. I hope the audio is better now. Sir. Yeah, yeah, it's clear now. So, uh, yes. So uh, this we had initiated this series uh, called uh, of conversations called uh, Why Women Write. So we're just trying to explore why women write, and we are try trying to talk to women from different genres. fiction right. poetry non fiction and so uh, you know we thought science is something you know why women or women write about science or why women don't write about science that is something which we thought we need to explore so uh, good evening everyone uh, tonight our guest is dr supriya besvarwa Dr. Besvarwa trained as a molecular biologist at University College London, but gave up the lab for the pen. She was former science and health editor at India Today magazine. She currently works in public health and is writing a book. So welcome, Supriya, uh, and we were also colleagues at uh, India Today India magazine. India Today, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, have very so, uh, happy memories. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I I find it very intriguing as well. You know, please tell us about this transition from the lab to the pen. You know, when did you realize that your the scientist in you has morphed is morphed into a science <laughs> writer? <laughs> writer. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, I was. almost like a all throughout my teenage years in school i was almost like i don't a split personality if you like it was very difficult for me to decide whether to go into we, when we in class 11 whether to take up the art stream or the science stream because i loved science but i also loved writing i've been writing since i was a child and that's always been my passion but and then someone told me that you can always write but you know science you have to study and i thought that was good advice so i went into science i went into biology and you know i had these dreams of uh, you know uh, cancer research and finding uh, you know maybe the cure for cancer or something of that sort and i love science i love uh, to me I, I of course i was a molecular biologist so going deeper and deeper into a cell and into the molecules you know looking how wonderfully they're arranged the the whole order of it all was just fascinating and the and the um it's just it was incredible how beautifully it's all laid out and going deep into how it works is almost you know like finding the secret of life so i love the science except when i went to the lab and i found that uh, while science itself is fascinating the actual lab work involves you know um uh, doing endless experiments like uh, very dreary stuff like uh, you know uh, st streaking uh, bacteria onto like what we call like jelly like agar plates then you know extracting those you it's like washing them doing almost like you know kitchen work and then you also have to follow the biological rhythm of of the um experiments you're doing if you're doing bacteria for example and if the bacteria decides to double its time or triple its time or whatever it is at midnight then you have to be there at midnight to stop it so you didn't have a life um mm -hmm. so i found that part of it very difficult but i love the science part of it i love the logic of it i love the results and what it means and i also mm -hmm. found when i was doing my phd and also when i went to do my postdoc i also found that i loved explaining it to uh, you know uh, grad students or undergraduate students i really and i also got involved in college uh, with the graduate society and i was active in setting up the newsletter and writing and i thought that perhaps what i really want to do is explain the beauty of science as well as the importance of science because my whole fa none of the my family members are scientists and mm -hmm. i but our life 
everything we do is science and tech associated but mm. and our lives are changing every day but we don't even realize the impact science is happening on us and because we don't have an uh, uh, we don't realize the impact science has on us we don't have a say in how it is shaping us mm. so that was my other uh, motivation so to say in moving to uh, to the pen from the lab mm-hmm. and i was it was not an easy transition though because mm-hmm. i was very confused for a long time i was i did my phd then i went and did my postdoc in the us and i was confused and i came back uh, here to delhi to my parents place but uh, and just started writing but i was very fortunate that i met someone who was in india today and i shared my articles and then went for an interview and a test and um, i you know i went to the bottom rung to have you know to to, uh, to try it out and then i've never looked back since it was the most interesting thing i've ever done and i really enjoyed it okay um okay um now uh, i was just looking at some statistics uh way back in 2014 the uh, a science survey of the top 50 science stars of twitter found that of the 50 most followed scientists only four are women more recently of the 584 science and tech stories written during 2017 for the conversation an independent source of news and views from the academic research community 72% were written by men and only 28% by women so what do you think is the reason for this gap i think well uh, the reason i uh, i would say it starts right from you know a much younger age uh there's there's a mindset i think to start with fewer women go to science fewer women think they will understand science science is often seen as too tech for women and i'm glad that many of those barriers are now being broken uh, you know as scientists uh, in science as well and i'm very glad to see that in india especially there's a big push to highlight women in science uh we recently saw you know uh, in in space in isro how what the uh, uh the achievements of the women scientists were uh but it's very difficult to overcome that bias to start with and i think uh there because of that even in when you go to something like writing uh most women who join are also not who want to write are not really interested in science um they're interested in politics they're interested in history they're interested in literature uh but mm. science there's a mindset there's like you know it it would be difficult to tackle is is a mindset so there is i think a mindset issue there there's also a societal bias perhaps equally you know mm. the people uh, the trust factor people, maybe perhaps people feel that men's science articles could be trusted more uh, possibly mm. uh, certainly when i was a science journalist and i went for press conferences and all of that it was uh, usually mostly men for the more technical issues if it was a general uh, issue then it would be an equal number and most of the uh, thing having said that you do have um, a number of very good health journalists who are women mm-hmm. but uh, but few of them have stuck on sanchita sharma is one person who stuck on and has done very well but mm-hmm. many of the health journalists i knew earlier have moved on to cover politics or other areas Um, mm-hmm. it's it's difficult to say that so i would say on both sides as a mindset bias a perception bias about women in science mm-hmm. which is which we really need to um beat because science effects can change the lives of women i think 
more than anybody and equally uh, mm. women can change science because it's also a different experience different perspective of looking at things and you need to have that perspective to uh in in addition to the logic and the uh, rigorous thinking in order to make great discoveries you always need to think out of the box so uh, uh what how would you remember uh, how do you see this women's perspective how is it different uh, how how is a uh, uh, well i think all of us are shaped by our experiences and mm-hmm. and the women's perspective women have always been uh, more collective in their approach and and that's very important in science in addition it's it's uh, that working as a team bouncing ideas of each other looking at mm. uh, things in a more holistic manner in a more um, inclusive manner perhaps mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. i hope i'm not going to be a cute years ago when i was a phd student we did a uh, we wanted to do a session on drugs and different aspects of drugs uh, mm-hmm. and and i thought that you know i was thinking of course of uh, drugs uh, the pill and i was mm-hmm. looking at it from the woman's point of view and i thought okay how do women perceive the pill is is that a, a completely freedom uh giving uh, life changing the um uh, a discovery but interestingly most women didn't think so they thought that the biggest scientific achievement which uh, changed their life was the or scientific or technological was the discovery of the washing machine so mm-hmm. it's a very different approach in how women see how other people see women's lives and how women actually see their lives Mm-hmm. I I remember once I did a story on why uh, very few women take up pure sciences as a career option and that was uh, you know uh, uh, many social scientists told me that it's basically it's long rigorous hours in the lab we and and the age when you have to get married and you are you know those reproductive years you have to have a baby and you have to take care of so those are the years when you have to you know put in your time and effort in the lab and you know uh, rigorous hours so that is something which dissuades women or you know they just drop out midway uh, because it's uh, so uh, in that sense i think we have some new policies uh, where yes. women scientists can uh, take up women- uh, yeah Well that's a very good point actually yes you're absolutely right you know uh, is you know academic life uh, especially in science is is horrible at post docs life you know you're slaving away at lo- uh, low salaries and as i said you know your life revolves around your experiments so there's no question of regular hours it's what it takes to make a discovery and it can take a toll on your personal life completely and definitely it is not conducive to a relationship or family building it's quite tough unless you have a very understanding uh, boss there have been lots of efforts being made uh, now for uh, to improve the lot of women including getting them to publish more uh, giving them support like you know workplace crashes and all of that and i think it's a um, something that's been recognized what they all but what also needs to be done is to encourage women to speak up women scientists to speak up about their work what you said right at the beginning of the mm-hmm. top 50 scientists who were followed on twitter only four were women which is a horrible uh, statistic mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but do they have is it that women are so women scientists are so busy you know uh, with their work and then going home and looking after the family that they don't have time to then go on to their twitter or manage you know communicate what they need to uh, what they are doing about their work uh that could be an issue mm-hmm. okay and uh, one uh, you're talking about publishing 
and in fact one scientist told me that uh, writing is an important skill for a scientist if you can write well uh, you can you know to publish your work and you can you know talk about your work and the world gets to know about your work do you agree oh absolutely it's critical you know scientific writing as opposed mm. to popular science writing is uh, is a a critical skill for a scientist because most you know science goes deeper and deeper into an area so that very often you, you become sometimes you could be only one of maybe five people that specializes in a very narrow area of very important but very narrow area of work to be published you need to convince the editor of a science journalist a uh, journal for example how mm. do you on uh, and everyone else how do you do that you need to be a clear writer you need to be able to explain logically and step by step what your work is and why it is important and why this discovery or achievement mm. Is, mm. is worth publishing so it's um, it's absolutely critical you know you may understand it all in your head on the results but mm. it's no good unless other people understand it too and it's it's often so um so technical that mm. that's that skill is very very important mm-hmm. but if you go beyond that as well and if you can communicate well even to Uh, a less technical scientific audience then you often have the chance to influence a whole new generation of students into mm-hmm. a field that is increasingly important mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the, and i would say it, i think it's even more important to communicate well in today's world because science and society are you know sort of like this in a way it's never been before of course you've had technological advances throughout human history but today mm. you're at the edge where you have artificial intelligence you have um uh, you know chips that are, are being put in human beings and on the other hand you know the advances in um in genetic technology in in gene editing are changing you know changing the game so to say and all of this is going to affect us in ways that we don't know in the future uh what is the future of our children hmm. and also that is on the macro level of course i tend to go to biology because that was my background but if mm-hmm. you look at areas like climate change like you know environmental mm-hmm. technology um mm-hmm. how is it changing why is it changing what is going mm-hmm. to happen uh all of these are going to affect our future but mm. for people to know about it and to be concerned about it the scientists who are working there need to be able to communicate it effectively mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. so definitely communication is a critical critical skill for a scientist for mm-hmm. for the sake of their research and for the sake of the world but are they taught that you know in the colleges and universities you know you're doing science you're doing research are they taught in my opinion not enough uh i think uh, to a for and explain it to others but i think a lot more needs to be done there Uh, uh, to, to explain to be able to ex- to be able to be clear enough to explain complicated technical material in a way that someone else a, a classic communication in a way that your grandmother would understand as you mean of course mm-hmm. that your grandmother is not a scientist it mm-hmm. is uh, is a critical mm-hmm. and uh, coming in, back to popular uh, yeah yeah go on yeah Uh, coming back to popular science writing again you know uh, how can we make it interesting for the common man because uh, people tend to it's a, oh it's a scientific article or it's the onus is on the science writer you know? so how can you make it interesting so that your grandmother can learn <laughs> uh, you know understand 
look at it i think from the other person's point of view uh you know what excites uh what is important to the people that you're addressing to your grandmother or son what is important to them what will what are they interested in what would they relate to think of it that way and and explain the science in a way that would link to their lives use mm. analogies use anecdotes use even jokes i would say mm. uh, if mm. if that it can explain the science better uh mm. in, you know most of all science is human make it human mm. uh, explain how it it can affect your everyday life and explain the terms of what's happening in a way that's simple and and mm-hmm. um, easily understood mm-hmm. which is actually uh needs practice it's not easy especially if you're used to scientific jargon mm-hmm. and that's one thing uh, do not use jargon mm. and, uh, you know try and explain it uh, you in a way i suppose i would say step out of your life as a scientist and mm. step into the person you were before you became a scientist what would you expect what would interest you what got you interested in science think of it that way and then make the story mm-hmm. uh, and and always always think of it as a story people like stories yeah definitely and uh, since we are talking about communication we are talking about media so do you think a media schools should incorporate a capsule on science education and absolutely. science uh, journalism absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. um uh, uh i when i was uh, uh, writing on science i found i actually found that because of my background and because i understood the science i often i was able to grasp what was happening and write a story from what seemed something very bland uh quite easily the other uh, uh whereas and uh, now that i've moved on and i'm on the other side i'm in public health i find that uh, a lot uh, you know a lot of media people uh, would you know it it would really help them in their stories and in their understanding in mm. reporting complex matters if they had more of a background on science if they learned if they learned a little more about it in a uh, media school certainly mm. uh, and it would also then lead to i hope more science write more female science writers perhaps as there are many mm. female journalists many maybe may some of them would opt for science writing as it is there are very few science writers male or female mm-hmm. and and the female ones are even uh, fewer mm-hmm. so very important mm-hmm. and uh, since we are talking about media schools like if we come back to our schools i mean elementary school or high school especially in india do you think uh, we've been able to inculcate a love for science as a subject among the students uh, i think we have failed somewhere uh, there is a fear for science and mathematics uh, we do have we do produce a large number of scientists but maybe that's not so much for the love of science i mean it's more you know if you go into technology it, at least in my day it was you go into uh, medicine or engineering you'll have a good job and then you'll have a you know a, a a steady career and all of that it was not so much for the love of science and mm-hmm. uh, the academic the scientific research part of it i don't think very people were very many people were inspired to go into that you're right they don't um, they need that love for science for the beauty of science and the importance of science is probably the excitement of science mm. you know um, i i remember uh, was it einstein who said you know when he sees the order of maths they sing to him the mm. mathematical equations uh, you know that 
appreciation of the beauty of explaining everything in an equation or in my case you know looking at a um, cell under the microscope and looking at all the structures and and then thinking of how incredible it is that you have this double helix and it unwinds at just the right time to mm-hmm. form just the right protein which goes to just the right place and then continue that way to to make us live every single minute of every single day mm-hmm. everything that we're doing now including talking to you is a function of uh, our dna uh, being translated into proteins and enzymes and uh, uh, and so on and it's being done every day perfectly it's just incredible mm-hmm. and that beauty that love i don't think is complete i think we need to work i wouldn't say that it's not there mm-hmm. uh, and i think there are some fantastic teachers uh, there as well i mean i went to kendriya vidyalaya kanapara mm-hmm. in guwahati and we mm-hmm. had a uh, and that's and that's where i biology to uh, i went into biology because i we had a great biology teacher Mm-hmm. and i love the subject uh, and and that shaped my whole future and so there mm-hmm. are many teachers like that i see my children's school they have fantastic teachers as well and you know who make the subject interesting but a lot more i think can be done mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, let's look. but then you know there's this conventional wisdom that science was written most exclusively by men you know until the advent of feminism in the 1960s and the 70s so do you think uh, there's an element of truth in it uh, well you know in terms of science fiction frankenstein was written by mary shelley in what century i don't know but it was by... so uh, there have been you know very talented women science fiction writers if you like from an old day in science science itself science writing itself i was just reading the other day that um, there was a lady in 1805 wrote, called jane marset who wrote about the view of chemistry history from the perspective of women but she wrote it so well that michael faraday came across it and he read it and that's how he became interested in uh chemistry and and then of course the rest is history so women mm-hmm. scientists but but we've all heard of michael faraday have we heard of jane marset probably mm-hmm. not so mm-hmm. uh you know there were these few people who were probably uh you know uh, a few women who were trying to go against the grain and right but uh i i suppose society at that time did not take women scientists as seriously and the ones who did make a difference really had to struggle mm-hmm. we've all heard this so uh, for for sci- for women scientists as well as women science writers but you're talking about science fiction mm-hmm. or or just science fiction yeah now um, i was just talking about science fiction yeah science fiction mm-hmm. uh there i have to admit i'm not a great science fiction reader but when i think of the ones i've read you're right they're all men mm-hmm. and that's not um uh, uh, consciously so is it that women don't write enough science fiction probably uh, uh, probably not uh or, or is it also that you know that it's not promoted enough maybe mm-hmm. it's a combination of both but i think again if if more women were to write uh, science fiction more of it would be taken up but maybe some of margaret atwood i mean i wouldn't call her a science fiction writer but mm-hmm. uh some of her writing um what was that book on the heart uh mm-hmm. you could it 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 could be in the in in sort of the um, uh the, the border of science fiction so mm-hmm. uh, but apart from that i agree with you that i i think more women need to write science fiction to mm-hmm. make it more interesting mm-hmm. but again uh, there are some who have been very uh, successful 
uh, uh, the film TV series Outlander. I think it was based on a book written by a, women, a woman, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the name slips my mind now, but there are, th- but they're few and far between, and probably not as celebrated. Uh, mm-hmm. I, 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 the time for women science fiction writers is yet to come, and maybe we should push that a little <laughs> further as well. <laughs> And I think women's, uh, Im- Im- their imagination would be more interest. Uh, we, we don't never know yes. really what, what you can visualize. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. A man, a man will visualize something like artificial intelligence. I don't know what will this save The woman. <laughs> yeah, what will she imagine? So I think, yeah. So let's hope that science fiction also becomes a popular genre among women yes. writers. And uh, yeah, uh, on a more serious note, you know, I, I had also read somewhere that access to science related fields for young women, especially ethnically and linguistically diverse women, is regularly denied because of systemic sexism and racism. So do you agree? <sighs> I well, I don't know enough to uh, agree or disagree, but I would not be surprised. Uh, first of all, uh, and you know, sexism and racism uh, need not always be deliberate. Sometimes it's unconscious. It's it's a bias that exists in people who may not even realize it. Uh, it's it's an attitude um you know you could be in a family and you know someone might just say to you oh you won't understand that or that's not for you or something of that sort or you know or you're just a girl and and if you're if people keep repeating that you believe that yourself so you know it can be a a barrier right from the beginning mm-hmm. uh, something you know, it, it, there has been research that's shown that, you know, the environment makes a big difference in how women perceive things. Uh, secondly, also, it could be uh, due to, uh, if it's, you know, from different ex- linguistic ethnic groups, uh, access to the information itself. Um, science is predominantly published, I think, in English. It's perhaps translated to some of the major languages, but if your language is not one of the major ones, how well is it uh, translated? Um, how how often do you have access to those material? Hmm. I mean, I don't know if you look at the sheer volume of um, sci- information on science in English. I just think of my language, Assamese. How much of it is accessible in Assamese? I don't know. How much, maybe it might be translated to Hindi, Tamil, perhaps, because there are a lot of scientists in in the South and other Southern languages, Um, Bengali even, but would they be translated to Assamese? Would they be translated to Khasi? Unlikely. So you start off with a disadvantage right from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Which brings you to the social aspect of science. And then that disadvantage probably continues. Yeah. And then there's also, then there is the mindset as well. And you're right, the sexism is known in uh, science. In fact, uh, and racism as well. I will just, for this, show you one of my favorite science writers, uh, Angela mm-hmm. Saini. I don't know if you see it. Can you, it's, it's written backwards, I think, so uh, maybe. Backwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, how, how does one do it? Uh, anyway, her book, Superior, and she's written another book, uh, with this talks about the science of race, how racism mm. is, uh, you know, entrenched in, in, sci- in the scientific community without people you know, not overtly, but covertly, not deliberately, perhaps, but it's there. And she's written another book uh, on sexism in science. Her previous book was on uh, sexism in science. So she highlights it 
very very well it's it's very much an issue mm-hmm. okay. and, and, when and the only yeah 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 so the ahead. only way to go around it is to to highlight it to bring it to the fore and and make it an issue and it's only then that people will realize and move forward and do something about it and for that i think we need more women in science to for, to start with you need mm-hmm. one or two um flag bearers who can inspire everyone else mm-hmm. and uh, do you think uh, there are enough there is enough writing for children on science uh not uh, it's changing but not really mm-hmm. uh and especially in these days you know everyone's on their ipad and you know you can have interactive books on science but uh i i think just judging by uh, in, i actively try to interest my children in science being a scientist myself uh and as a mother but it was not always easy to get good stuff of course you had very nice um, publications by national geographic and some of uh, but not enough i feel and mm-hmm. that maybe that should start from an even younger age getting children interested in science uh, making them realize because science is not something different science is a part of our lives everything we do is has science in it but that needs you know if if a child can realize that and realize that science is a part of their life science explains the wonder of life in a sense all around us i think that might make a difference mm-hmm. in fact um, when you were talking about attitude i remembered one um, anecdote where you know one lady who is an electrical engineer she is a qualified electrical engineer but uh, when she has to change the bulb in her house i mean she calls either her brother or her, her father <laughs> to do it then for uh, it seems it struck her you know the, oh i i i know this you know i i i i've studied this so then she realized that it came naturally to her you know oh from childhood it's always been a man's job changing yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah um, maybe if if it was more women doing it you wouldn't have the joke about how many men does it take to change a light bulb <laughs> okay and uh, uh, since we said that you know we don't read more about you know the science uh, especially women scientists so how much of this her story i'm not talking about his story but her story of science is written and especially in the context of india good question i'm thinking about it i'm trying to think uh you know and 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 i'm thinking very little not enough but to be fair uh uh, I, um, uh there is now a, a effort to uh, talk about her story so to say in science there's a whole science in a women in science group uh, uh i think there's a women in science portal which highlights uh different women's achievements in science i one of the big scientific institutions in the south is it iisc or is it um now she's um oh, they've uh, you know they have actually brought out publications on all the top women scientists in their institute who are doing incredible stuff so uh i think it's slowly changing but maybe we should push that further mm-hmm. so that they can inspire our young girls you know, if they read exactly. about these women exactly yeah. already you know science. it makes such a difference now my daughter uh, mm. i made a conscious decision to instead of giving her the usual fairy tales to give her a book uh, which is uh, what's it called bedtime stories for um uh for 
girls who are not the usual girls but these are all mm-hmm. stories um it's a book of stories what's it i've forgotten the name of it a uh, stories of women achievers in different fields including science and i would read that to her when she was a uh, baby uh, at bedtime and i think it's made a difference now she's quite i mean she's only 11 but she's uh, quite a feminist she's quite aware of what women can do you know mm-hmm. if we, i say oh that's not as sometimes you know unthinkingly i said oh no that's that's not for girls uh, without even realizing it of course because we all have our biases without realizing it and mm-hmm. immediately she she says why not mm-hmm. and and i i think it's because of the books that she read and similarly if you had more women scientists uh, i think it would make a big difference to uh, the perceptions of the future women the future female um, scientists so to say mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was there any particular book that you had read as a child that you know uh, ignited your um, interest in science is, is there anything um, or you read about some scientists um well what what uh, what i did read about the book that fascinated me was a double helix by um james watson um so but I, and i that got me into science the you know the whole and i think that's a classic example of a good science writing he talked about the excitement the emotion of the scientist what they did how they you know it was like doing a jigsaw puzzle how you know there was this big puzzle and how they went off in other directions and then came back to it and all of that but what also got me thinking was the critical part which was not admitted as much in the book of a female scientist called rosalind franklin uh it was her she was a pioneer in her field she did the x-rays of the dna which helped um Uh, these men solved the puzzle of the dna helix which of course changed biology and the world forever but she was not acknowledged at the time and of and of course she died before she got the nobel prize but she was never given her due and i when i read more and more about it uh then i realized that uh, more you know those are the kind of women that actually made a difference and uh you know i really felt that there are women out there who could make a difference the other book of course is um the silent spring mm. uh i read it and uh which was written of course by a woman scientist and it just horrified me it was like a wake up call and i was like oh my god what are we doing to ourselves that got me really interested in to, in the environment and even even when i was in school i would occasionally write articles um for the sentinel on those issues and some of them one or two were on the environment mm mm-hmm. yeah. uh, oh and, the uh, book that i was yeah. talking about my daughters is good night stories for rebel girls oh yeah yeah even i <laughs> got it for my daughter <laughs> <laughs> i remember now uh and um and uh, which who is your favorite science communicator either a person or a magazine or a journal i mean who do you what which one would you rate the best now uh, there are many good science communicators right now it there's a new york times writer called natalie angiers she wrote a book called woman which is all about you know and to the whole social aspect of being a woman from multiple it was actually her you know her journey in trying to conceive and looked at it from the point of view of women and fertility and science and the advances there and where that leaves a woman i thought it was really brilliantly written the other as i said angela sani's books um which is on on 
you know, on race science and women's science. Then um, Laurie Garrett, have you heard of her? She wrote this book called The Coming Plague, which, of course, it's almost like a prediction now. <laughs> Uh, she writes very well and mm -hmm. amongst men um, there's a very good science writer in the Atlantic called Ed Young he's written this fascinating book on um, the microbiome bio which is essentially it's a recent discovery that there are trillions of microbial organisms that are all over our body that are part of us and we have it from the time we're born and they influence uh, our body as much as our genes and all that, which, you know, takes you to, you know, how the environment influences us as well. It's a fascinating book, and he's a very good writer. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, of course, Siddharth Mukherjee and his book on cancer I found fascinating. So mm -hmm. many interesting, many good writers, many. Okay. And, um, but okay, the, uh, I think the like, most, yeah. I would like to add one, the, my, I think I should have, uh, my favorite would be Oliver Sacks, who's a neuroscientist. And I love the title of his book as well. The man who mistook uh, his wife for a hat. And it was okay. this, it's, it's very well written book, uh, uh, about different, um, experiences of his with different patients because he's a neuroscientist and they have different uh, problems and have the most curious outcomes but he writes it so well with uh, so interestingly and with just the right measure of clinical detachment and empathy which is a difficult balance to maintain mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, it has been a fascinating discussion we can go on and on, but uh, <laughs> since we are running out of time, I would just ask you the last question is that, you know, if any other women scientists, they would want to try uh, go for a transition from the lab to the pen, you know, would you give them some tips? What are the basics of science writing? What are the do's and don'ts that they have to follow? Well, to start with, uh, you know, love what you do in science and think about what you, why you love it. Right? When you're clear about why you love it, then it's very easy to explain to others. Uh, and, and then it comes through the love for the subject. Whatever you write, it, it comes through the enthusiasm, the love, the joy. Uh, second tip I would give them is write, write, write. When your spare time, you know, make time to write, write regularly, write about science regularly. Then uh, I think uh, also keep in mind uh, your audience or so try and be simple in your writing, try and be clear in your writing and try and explain the context, why it's important. What's the story? Because life is a story. So what you write about science Science is life, in my in my uh, opinion. So make it a story. Make it uh, a story that you would want people to listen. And but while making it a story, get your facts right. I think that is the the sort of golden rule of um, science writing. Get your facts right. Mm -hmm. uh, then to move to science from. The lab to the pen uh, completely. Well, you have to really uh, be very clear that that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And and if if you're clear, then keep writing, keep uh, uh, keep uh, trying to publish in whatever, and then you'll soon have a body of work and become an expert, and you'll know whether that's right for you or not. Mm -hmm. okay. well, certainly so, uh, for me the joy of writing uh, and especially writing about science it, you know I don't know about the audience but the satisfaction I get is tremendous and you need to I think have that um, 
to have that satisfaction and pleasure in yourself um, only then it's worth it mm-hmm. in fact i had gone to this world conference of science journalists one uh, once uh, it was in doha in qatar okay and uh, it was there that uh, you know i had attended many sessions and it was then that i had realized that there is science in everyday life you know uh, every every journalist is a science journalist <laughs> and uh, yes and, um, uh, and every journalist is a health journalist you know like every uh, like uh, every minister is a health minister you know, there is you have to talk about health when you're talking about health or you're talking about science so i it was a lovely conversation and i wish we could go on and on but then we're running out of time but uh, thank you so much supriya for giving us your time and i hope uh, young women would be encouraged and inspired by you know what you said and you know we'll have more and more women writing science and women writers, i hope so women science writers will be taken seriously more seriously and we'll have more yes. of them on the twitter hit list <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes let's let's make it a movement yeah. more women science writers out there yeah and the... so thank you so much happy good thank night. you so much for inviting me it's but thank you very much it's been a great pleasure thank you, thank thank you so you. much bye bye